This morning's gospel lesson is written in the first chapter of the gospel according to St. Mark, beginning with the fourth verse, the baptism of Jesus. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locust and wild honey, and this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Please bow your heads with me for a word of prayer. Father God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our salvation. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. Spirit of God, fall fresh in us today. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So this is the first Sunday in the church year, the season that we call Epiphany. And you know, it comes after Christmas. It comes after Advent. It comes after the Christmas trees and the hymns and the carols and all, all the joy of Christmas. And then, you know, I have to tell you, I, was, I did a sermon on the day after Christmas uh, at a care home, and the people, they didn't even want to hear carols anymore. They just said, preach on something else. But that's what happens with Christmas. That's what happens, and we, we go into the season of epiphany, and we don't, as a church, understand the importance of this season. The importance of what all the gospel lessons and all the lessons point to, but an epiphany is central to the Christian faith. It's central. And where, and where we see it and how the church uses, how the, but how the church defines the term epiphany is enfleshed in Matthew 2, 1 to 12. And again, it's one of those things, the wise men. There weren't three wise men. We don't know how many there were. It just says they had three gifts. And they, came, and they were looking for a savior. And the word of God left, led them down from uh, a, you know, near Baghdad all the way down to Bethlehem. All the way to a house where Jesus was. An infant just born, or maybe a few months old. We don't know. But when they came into his presence, they recognized, they saw in him the divine. And when they saw in him the divine, they could not do anything except to bow down and worship him. So in Epiphany, what we recognize, it is the hand of God that oftentimes in our lives, and we should pray for Epiphanies, that God would open to us what he puts before us, his word, and in the world around us, that God open it up so that we can see the divine in it. And we have that revelation that God is speaking to me, that God has touched my heart, my soul, my mind today, and I believe. And that my faith is increased. And I thank God for that as a word of worship. Our gospel lesson begins today with John the Baptist. And God used John the Baptist to give people revelations to open their mind. 
But you know, he, and again, you know, these are very short verses, but if you, like water, it's like a prism. When you look at those verses and when you look at what happens behind them, you can see just how amazing it is that John is a, was a, a child of promise. I mean, you should read like Luke 1, and it talks about his birth, how his birth is announced by the angel Gabriel to his father, Zechariah, as he's ministering as a priest. And, um, and then the angel says, you, your <coughs> wife's going to have a, a child. And he goes, but I'm old. She's old. We're barren. And, and then, you know, the angel says to him, but you are going to have a son. You are going to have a child. And you're to call his name John. And because you don't believe, you're not going to be able to speak until that child is born. And you know, the amazing thing is that even though there was this doubt, even though this God does this thing, they go home as a couple, she, uh, she conceived and a son was born. And that's John. And, and, and the angel said that the Holy Spirit will be in this baby even before he's born. Then he is born. And under the Jewish law, under the Torah, on the eighth day after his birth, he was taken to a synagogue to be circumcised. And he was given the name John. And, it, and you know, it's interesting, at that circumcision, who the father is, is then declaring, I am the father of that son. And so as soon as the child was circumcised, they were going to give him the name, and then he couldn't speak, but all of a sudden, his voice, he began to speak, and this is what he spoke publicly about his son. He said, and you, my child, you will be called the prophet of the Most High. You will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. And you know, it's interesting, the scriptures, like if you think about it, his dad was a priest, and under the Old Testament, because his dad was a priest, he, he was, this was his destiny in life, to become a priest, to serve in the temple, to go to Torah school, to, you know, and, and serve, just dedicated to the Lord, his life revolves around the temple, but yet, what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit takes him into the wilderness. And there he's kept alive by God, eating um, locusts and wild honey. And, and, and the, the Holy Spirit then teaches him. And so this baptism that he went out and began to baptize with, that is something that came directly from the lips of God. And he was fulfilling, and his preaching was fulfilling what God had ordained and taught him through the Holy Spirit in the desert. So you can see that this, this man, this John the Baptist, that he, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and many people could see that he was a prophet of God and came to him. And they confess their sins. And there's a reason that we, that even the text today describes John as wearing camel hair and eating the, the uh, wild honey and the locust. Because it's supposed to take us back to Elijah. If you read 2 Kings 1, 8, that's what Elijah was like. And so John the Baptist before the Messiah was going to come, it said that Elijah was going to come back and turn children to their parents and parents to their children. And that's exactly what was happening. That is exactly what his, his ministry was. And the angel Gabriel said that that was the case, and Jesus himself affirmed it in Matthew eleven fourteen. 14. He preached in the desert along the banks of the Jordan. And you know, my wife and I had the privilege of going there, being standing on the banks of the Jordan, probably not in the exact spot, but it's amazing to see it. And it's, it's by the Dead Sea, and it's quite breathtaking. This was his message. 
this is the message that Mark gives us. Repent, the Messiah is coming. Prepare, prepare by confessing your sins to God. If your contrition and grief for your sin are real and you want to repent to change, God will forgive you. John promised that one was, again, that one was coming that would baptize with the people with the Holy Spirit. And you know what was amazing? All of Israel, for the thousands of years before this day, they were waiting for the Messiah to come. But God had told John that the Messiah that everyone had been waiting for was going to be revealed to him. And so every day, every morning that he got up and he went down to the river to baptize people when they would assemble, John wondered, is today going to be the day that the one that was promised is going to come and I will see him? I will experience him. He was waiting. And you know, I, I'm sure he wondered, what was this Messiah going to do? Was he going to get up beside me? And was he going to preach like me? Was he going to, was he, what was he going to do? He had no idea. So on that day when the Messiah came, what's interesting is what does the Messiah do? But he kneels before John and says, baptize me. Baptize me. Put the water on me. In Luke's gospel, John even says, I, you should be baptizing me. I should be baptizing you. But Jesus says, do it so that all righteousness is fulfilled. And that's, that's really important. When Jesus was baptized, and this is what Jesus is talking about, this is the righteousness, his baptism is unique. Everybody that came to be baptized that day was a sinner. I mean, the Bible talks about being steeped in sin. It talks about like that sin is something that we believe firmly as Christians is something that happens at the fall. It, it, when the fall of man occurred, that there was a woman, that, that there was a, a change. In, we lost innocence. Before that, we were innocent, and there's innocence is lost. And now we know the difference between good and evil. We can understand that, but can't do that. We can't do that. And so... You know, it's in the Bible the, that uh, King David, he talked about this. King David said that our sin begins at conception. It's called the original sin. It's something that's in us. And it just kind of, Jesus talks about it, he wells up in us. And you know, all you have to do is look at the world around us. All you have to do is look at the trouble and the, 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 the fighting that we have in the church. Never mind the outside world. And that tells us about the presence of original sin. Jesus didn't have that. Jesus was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. He couldn't sin. And he can't sin for, our, for us and for our salvation. There are some that said that Jesus, he came to John humble and contrite because of his own imperfection. You'll hear that. But that's impossible. And it can't be that way because he's come to save us. And you know the amazing thing is, and I know that John did not expect this, but Jesus' bat baptism triggered something. It changed something. You know, a lot of people, they say to me, Pastor Ed, the Bible never preaches the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I say, yes, it does, in three places, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in the plate when Jesus was baptized. Because what do we see on this Sunday? What, what's the gospel lesson today? But we have the Son in the water. We have the Father speaking from heaven and the Holy Spirit coming down like a dove. 
and alighting on Jesus. There we have the Father who is the Creator, the Son who is our Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit who sanctifies us. This is important, so if anyone ever says to you, I don't believe in the Trinity, I don't even believe the Bible preaches it, there's three witnesses to the Trinity, there's three witnesses, and what this Gospel lesson shows us is it shows that the, our salvation our salvation is a work of the Holy Trinity, is a work of the Father, it's a work of the Son, and it's a work of the Holy Spirit. The Trinity is revealed to show us how much that God loves us, that He would give His own Son for our sin. There was a promise that God made through the prophet Jeremiah that I think is really important because this is what God that says this uh, that you know Ch Jeremiah spoke the, these words for God this is the covenant I will make for the people of Israel after that time I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts I will be their God and they will be my people no longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another know the Lord because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest declares the Lord for I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sin no more John's message of repentance was the beginning of the fulfillment of that new covenant the word baptism comes from the Greek baptizo, which means to immerse. And you know, the amazing thing is that we often, as Christians, what do we do? We always look at the, the, you know, the, the element that we can understand. We look at the water. And so when we hear the word baptism, what's the first thing you think about? You think about the water. How hot, how cold, how much, how little. But what is important here is that immersion. In baptism, when we speak the words, what are we immersed in? What are we dipped in? But we are dipped into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's what we're immersed in. We're immersed. When Jesus was baptized that day with the water, what was he immersed in? He was immersed in our need for forgiveness. What was he immersed in? He was immersed in the promise that God made to do two things, to forgive our sins and give us knowledge so that God would live with us. That's what Jesus was baptized into. And for us to receive that forgiveness of sin, what was he, what was he baptized into? He was baptized into the promises that are in the scripture and the most clear and concise promise in scripture is given in Isaiah chapter 52, 13, to 5312 the suffering servant because the way that God was going to forgive people's sin was to put the sin on the suffering servant I mean we need to read that those verses again and again and again and again because it shows God's heart I mean in those verses it declares to us we are just sheep that have gone astray we are people that can't keep our lives straight we are people that just we it's just, we're just, we're just sheep. That's all we are. And we need someone to be our shepherd. We need someone to care for us. We need someone, someone to be there for us and pay for us. Pay for our sin. And that's what Jesus did. So when he was immersed into, the, into our need for, for the forgiveness of sin, and into God's promise that the sin would be forgiven. That happened on Good Friday. It happened on Good Friday when he went to the cross. 
And all of the words in Isaiah were fulfilled. Chapter 52 and 53. They were all fulfilled on the cross. And just like in Isaiah, it says, when they laid him into the tomb, and then Isaiah said, but the tomb won't hold him, he will be brought to life. And that's exactly what happened on the third day. And then the prophet Joel, God speaking through the prophet Joel said, and when that price is paid, and when that day happens, then I'm going to anoint with the Holy Spirit, says God, on men and women. Everyone. I'm going to anoint. And so, on the third day, Jesus was resurrected. And we know this if you read in John's account of the gospel, that we have... Um, Jesus come to, in the middle of his disciples. They're locked away in a room. And they're afraid. And Jesus appears among them. And Jesus says, peace be with you. He shows them his hands and his feet. <coughs> Pierce. He shows them his side. He shows them that that covenant that they had or that God had made with them was fulfilled. That he had paid the price for them. He paid the price. And yet now comes the second part of it. And you know, it's the receiving the Holy Spirit. And King David knew how important it was to receive or to have the Holy Spirit. Because in Psalm 51, he says to God, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Don't take it. Because he knew that was his connection to God. It was the Holy Spirit working in David's life that allowed him to be the man of God, to make those decisions, the right decisions, to fight the right battles, to do the right thing always. That came from the Holy Spirit. And so then what Jesus did was he, he breathed on those 10 disciples and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now go into the world and help people. Preach the gospel to them. Preach about me. And as they, as they come to believe, you forgive their sins. And when you forgive their sins, they're forgiven. And then Jesus, what he does in, in Matthew's gospel in chapter 28, Jesus says, now go into the world and baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And teach people to obey what I have taught you, what I've commanded you. So you see, it's interesting. On his resurrection, we see the fulfillment of God's most passionate desire for us as people, for our sins to be forgiven, and secondly, that we would know Jesus, that we would know the Father, that we would know the Holy Spirit, that we would experience that. So Jesus' baptism, it... it it was a foreshadow. It predicted what was going to happen in the future. That in the future, after the resurrection, that we would be immersed. As he was immersed into the, our need for the forgiveness of sin, as he was immersed in the covenant for the forgiveness of sin, that because of that covenant and its fulfillment, that now we can be immersed in God. that we carry God. That through the eyes of faith, Derek carries God. You know, he's wearing a beautiful gown there. Is it satin? It's a satin gown, right? It's satin on the inside, yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, what's interesting, starting in the third century, all Christians wore a robe, a white robe when they were baptized. Whether they were Adults or children, babies, all wore a white robe. And the reason for that 
is in Isaiah, in the, in the Old Testament uh, prophet Isaiah, spoke about that one that God had arrayed him in the garments of salvation and in a robe of righteousness. And so when we baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, that Paul says in Galatians, we put on Christ. We put, and so that robe represents his little baptismal gown, represents physically what happens through faith. And that is he receives an even more beautiful gown. And that gown is the gown of salvation when he's joined to Jesus, when he's joined to his death. We heard it in the baptismal right. When, when he's joined to that death, his sins are forgiven. He's then joined to Christ's resurrection. And so that he, he, for him, the gateway of eternal life is open. And then he receives the robe of righteousness. And that is all of the good things that Jesus did in fulfilling the law for us, God gives him. So he has a garment of salvation and a robe of righteousness. And so when you look at that today, it's not just a cute baptismal gown. It is a representation of what is God has done for him in the realm of faith. He has a gown of beauty we cannot comprehend that God has given him. He is now a member of the body of Christ. That's what we mean by baptized into. It's into Jesus, into his body. We're all a part of that body. It's we forget that we're a part of that body that gets us into trouble. If we all really, truly believed that we are a part of his body, we could be different people. Different people. But that is a hope that Derek has. It's a hope. That's why this is such an important Sunday because it's a Sunday in which we remember, and Derek will remember. Well, probably he won't remember, but you will tell him, because I'd be really surprised if he remembered. But you will tell him that this was the day in which God said to him, you are my son. Today I've become your father. It's an important day. And we can't take it lightly. This is a dramatic event in his life. Changes his destiny. Do you believe that? Do you believe that he's a part of God? That God is in him? And he is in God? I'm sure that when you look at him, he's sleeping now, and you look at him, and I'm sure you wonder, what's he gonna be like when he grows up? What kind of a man is he gonna be? I'm sure there's times as parents, you're very confident, you do things, and you say, I'm gonna do this, he's gonna eat broccoli all the time, and you know, it's leafy greens, and lean protein and all that stuff because he's going to be big and strong. And you're going to do all those things. And then there's other times, I am sure, you just think, I can't do this. I can't do this. Right? But you did a wonderful thing for him today. You did. A wonderful thing. You know, Derek's life is a mystery, right? It is. We, we can't know the future. But, because he's baptized, you can know this, that his future is in God's hands. 
We don't know why things happen to us, the good and the bad. But the Bible teaches that God uses all things for the good of those who love him. Right now, we see Jesus in the sacraments, in the baptism, in the Holy Communion. We hear about him in the word. We're assured of his presence. But that same Jesus promises that he's the resurrection and the life, and that whoever believes in him will live even though they die, and whoever lives believing in him will never die. So Jesus promises that one day we will see him face to face. Jesus is touched by water. 2,000 years ago, so that he can touch us with water today. And in that, we received everything that Jesus was for us. All of his salvation, all of his righteousness. And it's a free gift from God. And that's to God's glory. And it's important that Derek get to know his father, get to know his brother through the Holy Spirit. That happens in the word and in the sacrament. That's a promise that God makes. And it's a promise, a covenant that God makes with Derek, and it's going to be God that brings it about, that always